So let's talk about essentially information and power. And of course, um, at least I don't, and maybe none of us here really cares about real power, but we're talking about academic power, or knowledge power, or, or kind of ability to make a difference in things that we care about. So let, let's talk just a bit about this. And I want to give you two examples. Essentially, the example of, of biodiversity data. We've already heard quite a bit about this today. And also a brief example from the biological literature, which is to say uh, scientific journal uh, publications. Just to, to get us all thinking about what it means to have access, what it means to share. So let's talk about these things just a bit. Um, let's talk about biodiversity data access. Um, I want to give you some examples from the Atlas of the Distribution of Birds of Mexico. This is a project I've been co-leading for 22 years now. Um, we edited the, the book-length manuscript 12 years ago. It was allegedly then in final form, but we still haven't finalized it and published it. So this is a bit of an embarrassment, but it, it was also kind of my first big experiment, my first opportunity to play with big data sets. So where this all began was in the middle 1980s, some very bright ornithologists in Mexico, one of whom will be coming as an instructor for next week's course, um, but some very bright ornithologists in Mexico, a couple friends like me who would come to visit and come to work every so often. But we all got very frustrated about the absence of information on Mexican biodiversity in Mexico. And so the very first thing that actually they took on, I didn't participate in this project, but it was simply what's, what's out there in the literature. And so they did a, a massive compilation of the bibliography of the birds of Mexico. The earliest uh, specific reference that they found then was 1825. And you can see they, they published this first summary in 1992. Since this time, just on a fun note, there appeared a manuscript, unpublished, from the 1780s, written in Latin. Species accounts for more than 200 species of birds as a result of an early expedition sent by the Spanish crown to Mexico. And so two of us brushed off our high school Latin, relearned it, translated the entire uh, Birds of Mexico as of 1780s, and we actually published an ornithology of this, this expedition that happened more than 200 years before. So we've pushed this date back a good 40 years now. Um, that was a start. That was just what's been published about the Birds of Mexico. Then we set about compiling what is pretty much an exhaustive database of all bird specimens ever collected in Mexico. So what this involved was a very laborious process, because we're doing this in the early 1990s, very laborious process of figuring out which data sets are digital and convincing the curators to share those data sets with us, figuring out which data exist, which is to say which museums have big collections of Mexican birds, and finding a way to make the data associated with those birds digital. And most of the time what we did was simply to go to the institution and one person with a big, fat, heavy, old laptop keying in data and another person reading data 
Yeah. Take the bird's tag, flip it, read this, read this, locality, species, et cetera, et cetera. We redid the taxonomy of Mexican birds, and we come up with a data set which is approximately 420,000 records, specimen records of Mexican birds. It's the contents of 84 natural history museums, of which fewer than half were digital, and so half, 40 some institutions, we literally had to go in and find a way to digitize the data associated with those specimens. There was one institution where the curator kind of absentmindedly said to us, there's the copy machine, use it for anything you want. <laughs> and so he didn't notice that we copied the entire paper catalog of the institution. It was literally six or seven reams of paper. Took it all to Mexico. Hired an army of undergrads to pass this data into digital format and then sent them back a database for their collection. I think he was angry and pleased at the same moment. So we've spent now a couple decades cleaning these data. Again, we redid the taxonomy. We, we inspected all outliers and all surprising records. Um, and now we're in the the very final phases of putting this, it'll be a large two volume book uh, together for publication. But I just want to show you a couple interesting details about this. This is the number of uh, records per year. And you can see basically what you expect, which is in the 1800s, not much was happening. You can see very interesting uh, big drops associated with the Mexican Revolution and the First World War. You can see this big pulse in the 1990s, which is the emergence of Mexico's own ornithological community. You can see highs and lows. There's a lot of information in here. Cumulatively, we go from essentially nothing as of 1880. There were hundreds of specimens, but not much, up to, again, a little bit below a half a million specimen records of birds from this one country. Now, from this one country, which is to say the bird was collected in Mexico, but the institutions that are Mexican that hold those specimens are relatively few. And the rest of the world holds all the rest. Some very big ones. This is the Moore Laboratory of Zoology at Occidental College in Los Angeles. And they kind of go down to smaller and smaller. I think this is the University of Kansas, about fourth largest outside of Mexico. Um, so one thing we had to do was work with Mexican colleagues and then work with colleagues the whole world over. And that was a lot of essentially data recopulation. Um, this is a very interesting graphic which, which I think probably applies in slightly different ways to each one of your countries. If we look at essentially the institutions where the specimens end up, here's Europe, here's North America, and here is the home country, in this case, Mexico. And what we see is that the European specimens are basically accumulated at the end of the 19th century. And by the late 19th century, US and Canada are stepping in and doing the bulk of the exploration. The common statement in Mexico is that it's very distant from God, but very close to the United States. So it was very convenient for US-based biologists to go down to Mexico in you know, winter break or summer break and do some collecting. And then very interesting, by the 1980s, it essentially stops from North America. But you see this Mexican pulse coming in. And so you have 
this institution was founded in 1986, and all of those specimens have accumulated just in these 20 some years. So that's a really interesting set of phenomena. And you can imagine for any country around the biodiversity rich south, you can imagine different configurations of this. In some cases, maybe Europe dominated longer or more, and North America had a greater or lesser role. And in some countries, this endemic pulse has happened or is just starting or hasn't yet happened. So we can imagine kind of very different configurations of this graph, but the whole phenomenon being fairly similar. So here's, a, here's just a fun thing that I've been musing about, and it's essentially information as academic power. Um, this is from that first bibliography uh, summary that I showed you. It's number of journal publications per year from 1825 with Alexander von Humboldt to present, okay? And what you see is a phenomenon that we all are pretty familiar with, that the scientific literature is growing massively. Uh, but here's the interesting thing. Here we're looking at the proportion of authors of those publications per year who are Mexican, versus who are non-Mexican. And so what you see is here early on in the 1800s, all of the science about Mexican birds was being done by non-Mexicans, mostly Europeans. Similarly, early 20th century, we see that same dominance. In this case, it's mostly North Americans. But notice that that proportion of authorship comes down from 100% to about 70% at present, sorry, 30% at present. And what's happening is that Mexico is essentially taking its own ornithological um, future into its own hands. So this is very tightly correlated with essentially bringing that information powerfully back to Mexico and building collections resources within Mexico. And you see the effect in terms of Mexican ornithologists being able to do good, solid, published work on Mexican birds. Correlation is not causation. In this case, I believe cor correlation reflects causation, okay? So that's, these are just kind of vignettes for you to think about. But I would assert to you that open access to scientific data has serious implications in making possible progress in science. It's obvious, but here's an example. Now let's talk about the scientific literature. And I want to give you an example that we don't always think about. Um, I'll take the example of my own department at the University of Kansas. And that is a summary of most of the frequency distribution of their journal publications during 2001 to 2009. And so essentially, the journal in which my colleagues published the most is the American Journal of Botany, 40 publications. Okay, and then we get out here to Journal of Evolutionary Biology, and we've got, maybe that's nine publications. And then there's a long tail that goes way out to the, to the right of journals where my colleagues published once, twice, three times, okay? So that's essentially our medium of communication. That is how you know, Fatima can look at the work of some other professor who is at the University of Kansas and understand what that person is doing, right? Well, the question I have is how effectively can Fatima or other interested people around the world get access to that science communication? So just as an example, I took 10 publications by my colleagues 
each one in a different journal. So a review of paleobotany and palynology, ecology letters, herpetologica, MPE, etc., etc. Okay, each one of these a different journal. I took this bibliography and I sent it to 50 colleagues around the world. And each of those colleagues, I said, could you please go to your office and use whatever means you usually use to try to get access to that publication and simply report back to me which publications you were able to get a PDF of, some final version of the published paper. It's very interesting what, what happened. For none of these journals, was every single one of my colleagues able to get access to the paper. Systematic biology and molecular biology and evolution were the two best. And even there, 8% of my colleagues couldn't see the paper. And then look at this, we have three journals at the bottom of the list where more than half of the people who tried, colleagues of mine who are publishing, uh, scientists tried and couldn't get access to those papers. If you look at it geographically, where you see these green circles, those are two colleagues out of 50 who were able to get access to 10 out of 10 publications. Only two. None of them is in North America, none of them is in South America, none of them is, is in Africa, that's, in, that's Spain, by the way. Um, so we have two European colleagues who had 100% access. Everybody else ended up frustrated about something. So why is this happening? When you have published scientific papers, who has read the copyright agreement? Have you, Chris? When you've published, do you read the copyright agreement? I don't. Okay, at least you're honest. Um, that's very common. In fact, I hadn't until I got into this, this mess of open access to the scientific literature. Let's read a couple, okay? I just grabbed some from the last few papers I've published. This is University of California Press. Um, permissions for use. You can use your article, you can use your own article, provided you acknowledge the original publication and you don't sell it or essentially compete with the journal. That's pretty good. And that is you can use your article without contacting or asking permission. That's awfully good. And they give a, a bunch of uses to which you can put it. So this is actually not bad. It's also not very common. Let's look at this one, Springer. Copyright assignment. So copyright to this article is assigned to Springer Science and Business Media. Copyright assignment includes, without limitation, the exclusible right, and they can assign it to somebody else, they can sell it to somebody else, they can sub-license it to somebody else, they can do whatever they want, to reproduce, publish, distribute, transmit, make available, and store the article. You can self-archive not the final version, but the pre-final version on your own website. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Of course, it can't happen until a year after publication. That's pretty bad. So, very complex, a lot of legalese. But there's some good things in there, some bad things. Here's my favorite one. Uh, this is a journal that, that I deal with or used to deal with as part of my public health work. And basically it says, authors assign the copyright to the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, period. American Society shall have the exclusive right of publishing, disseminating, and disposing of, you like that? Disposing of, getting rid of the article for sale throughout the world. 
complete copyright transfer. Now, what is copyright? That's another thing that I certainly couldn't have told you in detail before I blew five years in this field. But essentially, copyright is a set of, re of rights. It's the right to reproduce your work. So that involves you know, sending a PDF to Tanya. Or it involves putting it up on a website. Adapting it, so I may want to rework my original publication and do something different with it. Distributing it, that goes back to the same thing of, of sending a PDF to a colleague. Performing doesn't apply so much to us. Maybe I'm performing before you right now. Um, and displaying their work. What it comes down to is that when you, when you assign copyright blithely, without reading, and without objecting to those rather absolute conditions of, I transfer copyright completely, 